We're trying to document the biodiversity of this mountain. There's a lot of human impact, human encroachment. This part of the mountain was just added to the park last year. It's been a national park for since Portuguese times, and uh, there's been a national park. Gora goes a national park, but Gordon goes a mountain was never part of the park until the last year. And um, but with all the human impacts here, were uh, and also the threat of global warming and climatic change, we want to uh, get some baseline data on what species occur on this mountain. And uh, this one, it's Crocidura. You see the long bristles on the tail? Yeah, yeah. Mucho trabajo. Trabajo. But two species. Okay, okay. And the more species we can document and the more uh, preferred habitats we can associate those species with, that will be our benchmark and our baseline for future work. Especially when it comes to conservation. You don't conserve what you don't know. You conserve what you know. Um, obviously we can document that by trees and vegetation. We can document it through birds. Um, I document it through mammals. Buckets are designed for two groups of animals that we can't catch in the traditional mouse traps. Uh, shrews, number one, and number two, the small, uh, uh, they're called dendromus, the tree climbing mice, that are very small and they're too small to jump out. So this catches a different group of animals based usually on size. So it's another Dendromus, and he's a little dorsal stripe. And if you can see, they're, they're very strange feet. Look at that. With a prehensile toe and a prehensile tail, you can see it's how he can control that tail. It's like a live worm, so he can, like a New World monkey, he can hold on with that tail. But very unique feet, very primitive group of mice. Agora, cá na Serra da Corongosa, estou fazendo um trabalho acerca de parasitas em 
aves e mamíferos, essencialmente uh, do sangue e do trato gastrointestinal. Portanto, a partir deste trabalho, nós podemos, uh, fazer, podemos, podemos fazer um censo o que é sobre os parasitas que existem em mamíferos e que existem em aves da Serra da Corregosa. So with the, all these different lice, they specialize in different parts of the body often. So there'll be, there'll be body lice, there'll be wing lice, um, there'll be some that prefer the head. And we're interested in all of them. The, um, lice can do several different things. There are some lice that feed on the feathers. So they actually destroy the feather barbs, they chew them. They're called chewing lice. Um, the other lice are called sucking lice and they, they, actually, they actually suck blood from the host, from the bird. So we put the lice in these little 100% um, ethanol vials that just preserves the morphology and the DNA so that they can be taken back and both genetic and morphological studies can be done. E assim estamos a trabalhar em grupo em que um faz uma parte, o outro complementa a, a outra parte. Enquanto um grupo trabalha com mamíferos, o outro grupo trabalha com as aves, é o complemento trabalhando com parasitas das aves e parasitas dos mamíferos. On average, we're only taking three or four individuals of any particular species and maximally 10. So it's a very small number compared to what should be um, the number of individuals that should be in the population. And we're keeping track of all the different species and the number of individuals of each species that we we catch in the nets. We're making four slides so that we can share. So we use these uh, specially treated filter paper cards called FTA cards. Um, and it's a really stable way of preserving DNA. And we can do extractions from the card and screen for blood parasites, and we can also get nuclear DNA from the host. Quickly attach the blood tag so we keep track. It weighed 66 grams. We do this, this sort of um, two, two sample approach because if we have blood on the FTA card that preserves the DNA and we have blood on the slides, then we can get the molecular data and identify the species molecularly. Um, and then we can go to the slide and say, you know, what exactly is it? Can we tie the DNA to the morphology and get a better species description that way. Okay. So we find it important that once we collect a bird from its environment, we take the data which we are looking for, like the blood sample, the dam cell for the genetics and what have you, and then the remainder of it we prepare it as a study skin and keep it at the museum as a future reference and you'll be able to understand that a bit better. The museum is like a big library of biodiversity. These, the specimens we're collecting today are contributing, are adding to that, and 
and scientists 150 years from now will be able to go back and look at these specimens and look at the um, and do all sorts of studies on them. Whatever your research is all about, you can work with that skin, and you are you are okay. Make sure that the skin resembles the life size of a bed which you collected. Otherwise, it will not make a good reference to other scientists. Essa colaboração que, que o Museu de História Natural de Chicago estabeleceu com o Museu de História Natural de Maputo é muito importante porque essas técnicas eh, estão, que estou aqui a, a beneficiar-me se não estivesse neste estudo também não teria como, ter, como, como uh, aprender. And so they know now there is a park and we have this conservation, but it's good to know what we want to conserve. A água sai nas montanhas. Se não ter árvores nas montanhas, o problema vão ver o que é secas. E onde é que vai sair a água? Se teres árvore, a água sempre mantém-se nos rios. Porque a comunidade, quando não ter água, não fica bem. Estou a garantir que a Serra da Gorongosa, que, nos abaste, a, que vai abastecer de água para todas as machambas. So for the conservationist to do his work properly, you need to know what is there and what is not there. So as part of the inventory that we're doing, we're really interested in knowing what kinds of blood parasites uh, live in the birds and small mammals from Mozambique. So we're bringing the specimens into the lab, and once we have them in the DNA lab here at the Field Museum, we are using special primers to screen for, in particular, for malarial parasites. We can tell that some of the birds that were sampled for us in Mozambique are indeed infected with malaria. And the reason we know that is because each well that's represented in this gel contains DNA from malarial-causing parasites. So if a bird is positive for malaria, it will have a highlighted band of DNA. One of the things that, one of the larger questions that we're after in this project is to understand the conditions under which parasites or pathogens jump ship, change hosts, go from, say, a bird to a mammal, or from a bird even to a human. And then we might get clues from those studies in how we might treat human malaria, how we might mitigate it or have environmental controls over malaria that directly affects people. OK, 
Okay, so this is our new species of Myosaurix from Mount Gorongosa, collected last August. And uh, so our question now that we're grappling with, is this new species confined to Mount Gorongosa, or is it shared with the highlands of eastern Zimbabwe? In any case, it's new. Uh, on one hand, it could be a unique species for the mountain. On the other hand, it could be a unique species for the area. So here's a map of Africa. The mammal communities from Gorongosa are completely separate from the Malawi Rift, from the Albertine Rift, from Ethiopia. So once you cross the Zambezi, we're in like essentially another continent. So it's a, a very unique outlier. So that's where we stand now and we're hoping to get the genetic results any week. So the description of this new species of mammals for science from Mount Gorongosa speaks to a couple of things. On one hand, it uh, speaks to the importance of integrating conservation with uh, research, and in particular, specimen-based research into uh, understanding biological diversity. Um, on the other hand, the fact we have one new species here suggests there might be a lot of other things worth investigating in Mount Gorongosa. And then finally, in terms of the biggest picture, uh, it speaks to the long-term isolation of Mount Gorongosa from the rest of continental Africa, really. And uh, it's, it's giving us a big biogeographic picture of uh, uh, continental biodiversity. In isolation, I don't think you can achieve anything. So always when you work together, you share knowledge, you pull up resources together and in the end you're able to maximize on what you want to achieve. Never tear a go can and read. Never see why. But I'm going to be said, I'm going to be. 